Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the example of David, that though he had sinned so greatly before you, yet you in your love and your grace and your mercy washed him and cleansed him and forgave him from sin. Lord, we thank you that there is no sin that you cannot forgive. We thank you, Lord, that there's no failure that you can't redeem, that there's no pit out of which you can deliver your people. Lord, we thank you for the great redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the great sacrifice that he paid when he died for us. And we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy that you extend to each one of us. And so, Lord, I pray today that if there's anyone here that has never experienced the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, that you would open up their hearts to the gospel. I pray that they would hear your word, that it would pierce their hearts, and it would move them to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I pray for your children, for all of us here, that know you and belong to you, that have turned and placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I pray for us who are your children. I pray, Lord, that you would cleanse us from sin. I pray that you would deal in our hearts in a freshness of grace with new forgiveness and new cleansing. I pray, Lord God, that you would draw us back to yourself. I pray, Lord, that if there is any one of us, your children, who are straying from you, that you would work upon our hearts today, that you would draw us back to you. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your cleansing. I pray that you would give us pure hearts so that we can offer to you pure and holy worship. Lord, we pray that you would bless this service and that Jesus Christ would be glorified and honored and uplifted in all that's said and done, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. We extend to you a warm welcome, and if you're a visitor, if you would, you'll find a visitor's card in the back of the pew in front of you. If you could fill that out and put it in the offering plate as it comes around, we would appreciate it. In preparation for communion today, our scripture reading will be from Psalm 51. So if you'll open, please, to Psalm 51. Psalm chapter 51. Psalm 51. For the choir director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will sing joyfully of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. 
for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Today we have as our guest speaker, Mr. Troy Jones, who is a graduate student at Maranatha Baptist University. And he is taking a course in biblical counseling. So he is also the nephew of Dr. Milton Jones, whom we've had here several times. So we extend to him a warm welcome and we look forward to hearing him preach. Well, good morning. It is an absolute pleasure to be here at Calvary Baptist. Uh, so m some of you may, may or may not know, but Dr. Milton Jones, he's preached here a number of times before, is actually uh, my uncle. Uh, he could be taken as my grandpa because we are exactly 50 years apart. Uh, so there's a bit, of a bit of a difference there, but he is a dear friend and a mentor. Um, he actually serves on staff at MBU in a number of roles. And I also do as well. I am a dormitory supervisor for Maranatha Baptist University. Uh, so my job entails getting to invest and develop the guys in the dorm. Uh, Toby Bellrich over here was in Cary for many years, so it was good to see a familiar face. So with that, go ahead, let's go ahead and begin this morning. So here's the deal. Every good business has a mission statement, right? It's a summary of their values and their purpose and their mission. The mission statement is at their very core of the company. I mean, everything the company does, from the products it produces, to the steps it takes, to the campaigns it pushes, are all in the light of that central idea. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some mission statements. I'm, I want to see if you can maybe guess what in the world, which company it could belong to. So this one's pretty easy. Maybe you can guess. We save people money so they can live better. Walmart, absolutely nailed it, Walmart. All right, here's a little, here's a little tougher one. Uh, to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Facebook, Facebook. Uh, and this last one, I'm going to be honest, they tried way too hard on this last one. There's too many words. Uh, um, let me give it to you. To refresh the world, to inspire moments of optimism and happiness, to create value and to make a difference. Coca-Cola. Yeah, they tried way too hard with that one. A little too much effort there. So here's the deal. In similar fashion, there is a central core, just like at these businesses, there is a central core to everything we do as Christians, right? Well, what is it? Simply put, it is the gospel. You know, unfortunately, I think we have a very bad habit of placing the gospel in a separate box from the rest of Christian living. It's like over here in box A, you know, we have discipleship, we have the community of the church, we have the ministry and worship. And then over here in box B, in a separate container, we have the gospel. You know, it's for evangelism. It's for unsaved folks. But my friends, can I tell you, that it is deeply foolish thinking to think that the gospel is somehow separated or removed from the rest of Christian living. My friends, if Jesus was not sent to the cross, if he did not die there on behalf of us, there would be no Christianity. The vital foundation of Christian living the vital foundation of how we live our lives, it is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It is the gospel. You know, just as a business or a company works in the light of its mission statement, which explains, it motivates the driving foundation for everything that they do, so much Christians live in the light of the gospel. It is the means for eternal hope it is, it is the way we can have a personal relationship with the Father. It is the driving force behind our zeal for evangelism. Which brings us to our text this morning, Hebrews chapter 10. 
Hebrews chapter 10. In the preceding chapters, the author of Hebrews has laid out some incredible doctrines, right? As he appeals to the Jewish audience. So far, he has exclaimed that Jesus, he is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the great priestly order because he is the high priest. He has done away with the old covenant. He has established a new covenant through his sacrifice once and for all on the cross. If you look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, we see the author of Hebrews gives us a bit of a summary of everything he has covered so far in the text. Look at me at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, and for all, he now forever lives to enter... Whoa, there we go. My bad, sorry. Wrong verse. There it is. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, 20. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. This is a wonderful summary of the function and effect of what Jesus did and what he does. My friends, it is the gospel. And this brings us to our main text this morning. The following verses provide multiple practical exhortations for how we're supposed to live in the light of this truth, how we're supposed to live in the light of the gospel. And it can be easily summarized in a very simple idea. We must live in the light of the gospel. Now, the author expresses how we're supposed to do that with three very practical exhortations. Number one, we must live in the light of the gospel by drawing near to God. We must live in the light of the gospel by drawing near to God. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near is a very important phrase. You know, the Heavenly Father is personally inviting us into His presence. He is inviting us to have a personal relationship with Him. And not only is He inviting us to have a personal relationship with Him, He has a very important modifier. He says to do so boldly or confidently. He says to do so with a true heart or with genuine sincerity in full assurance of faith with an idea of a full confidence having no doubt that we have access to the father i'm reminded of hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 where the author writes let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 which we just read having therefore brethren boldness or confidence to enter into the holiest or the very presence of of God. But at times, I think we often shamefully take this for granted. My friends, do you truly realize that under the old covenant, when people wrongly entered before the righteous presence of God, when they broke God's strict commands on how to approach his holiness, they died. They died. I think of Uzzah. When he touched the Ark of the Covenant to keep it from falling, he died. Aaron's sons, Nahab and Abihu, when they took strange fire from outside of the tabernacle into the presence of the Lord, they died. Approaching the holy, sinless, perfect presence of God, it was a big deal. It was such a big deal that people died. The high priest over the Israelites only entered the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, once a year. Being in the presence of God, it was a serious affair. And man, it only makes it so much more amazing that under the new covenant, God invites us to boldly and confidently enter the presence of God. But how? How? Well, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, by the blood of Jesus. 
You know, the way that we have a close and personal and intimate relationship with God it is because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, my friends, it is because of the gospel. It is because of the gospel that we are adopted as his children. We can tenderly call him Abba, Father. It is because of the gospel. So my father pastors in Panama City, Florida, and he's been a senior pastor for about 23 or so years now. About halfway through his ministry, he began to encounter some medical difficulties. He began to have horrible, horrible migraines. Now, let me give some caveats to this. This wasn't just a simple headache. These were the kind of the migraines that would, that would make your vision fuzzy, the kind of migraines that would numb your body, the kind of migraines that would make it hard to think. And you know what was so impressive to me is that despite that physical affirmity, he would get up every morning to preach, and he would have a smile. And not only that, after the service, he would love people, give them hugs, and encourage them. He would visit people in their home. He would care for them. All the meanwhile, he was suffering internally. But what means the most to me as a son is even after a long Sunday of pushing himself and fighting through the pain, he would come home to me and give me a hug and say that I love you. But can I be transparent with you? I painfully took it for granted. As a kid, I could care less what my father was doing. I had my own ambitions. I had my own plans. I had my own ideas of what I wanted to do. And the sacrifices my dad made, not only for the church and for our family, but for me, I took it for granted. It is perhaps one of the deepest regrets I have of, of my childhood. You know, sometimes I wish I could go back and I wish I could tell my father, I'm sorry. I'm so thankful for what you're doing. But I didn't. My friends, do you take access to our Heavenly Father for granted? Do you even care? Do you even realize what you have the ability to do? Can I remind you? The price for our eternity was great. The cost was high, and someone had to pay. And praise God that Jesus paid it in full on the cross. But man, what a shame it would be. What a shame it would be to forget. Can I ask you a very personal question this morning? Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten the price that was paid? Have you forgotten the cost that was put down in full for you? Or do you go about your life and you could care less? If we had to examine your Christian living, Is it touched by the gospel? Are you moved to tears when you think about the price that was paid for you? Or has it grown cold? Has it become empty? Has it become just about some dude in a book written a long time ago? My friends, we cannot forget. So you may ask me, how do you live in the light of the gospel? Well, my friends, it is simple. We do what the gospel made possible. We draw near to God. So can I, can I encourage you that perhaps today you need to draw near to God 
and thank him for the price that was paid. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe you have forgotten. So number one, how do we live in the light of the gospel? Well, number one, we live in the light of the gospel by drawing near to God. Number two, we live in the light of the gospel by keeping the faith. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. It reads, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. To hold fast is to to be diligent, to cling to, to take firm grasp of, to not compromise. I think of Deuteronomy chapter 10, where it says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, thou shalt serve him, and thou shalt cleave to him, or hold fast to him. Or Joshua 23 reads, But cleave, but cling, but hold fast unto the Lord your God. Well, hold fast to what? Well, the text says, to the profession of our faith. And this with itself holds two ideas. Not only does it mean to hold fast or to cling to the promises of God, but also it means to hold fast to the commands of God. My friends, we must keep guard. We must stand firm on what God has commanded us to do. You know, it it seems to me that every year the world redefines what morality is. It's like a news, this just in, this is okay now. Modern culture, what is it doing? It is attacking the church, it is attacking its values, its morals, its principles, its practices. Ultimately, my friends, the world is attacking the very character of God. And you know what? I wish I could say that all churches are holding fast against the oppression of the world and obedience to God. I wish I could. But unfortunately, it is not always true. Can I tell you? Woefully, there is a pandemic of pacifism infecting the church. It is a a pacifism that is standing idly by as the world campaigns corruption and evil. It is a pacifism that is giving up in the face of oppression. It is a pacifism that is conforming to cultural opposition. There is a pandemic of pacifism infecting the church today. Not too long ago, I had a friend of mine in a print shop, and uh, she was getting some flyers print out for her small business. And she couldn't help but notice that the, the printer next to her, there was a gentleman printing out what appeared to be some kind of church flyer or church bulletin. Well, she asked, you know, what is this for? The man answered and he said, well, I'm actually printing out some church documents. I'm a pastor for a local church here. Well, she asked, well, what church documents are you printing out? Well, he looked at her and he said, the the denomination for which my church is attached to, it is a formal letter to leave that denomination. And I'm presenting it to my church this Sunday. Well, why? Well, his particular mainline denomination, it was now embracing homosexuality within the church. Much more than that, it was even licensing and embracing homosexuality in the licensed pulpit. And the pastor, he looked at the word. He looked at what his denomination was doing, and he knew it was time to leave. He was keeping the faith. He was standing firm on what needed to happen. My question is this. Would you be willing to do the same? God forbid that any church would give up the fight against evil. I'll tell you what, I pray that Calvary Baptist Church would be a church that would stand fast. It would be a church that would obey God, a church that would keep the faith, a church that would preach the gospel till Jesus comes. But he gives an interesting modifier in the text. We're supposed to keep the faith, but how? He says, without wavering. So we're we're to not be shaky or inconsistent. We are to be firm even in the face of opposition. Let's be honest with ourselves. That seems, one word, scary. Let's be honest. The cultural weight of the world is intimidating. 
We would be lying if we did not accept that fact. It is intimidating. It is at times, it is scary. In places in the world, it even involves the cost of life. So you may be asking yourself, how in the world am I supposed to keep the faith without wavering? Well, can I tell you that the text answers that question? It says, for he is faithful, that promised. Psalm 145, 17 says, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, faithful in all he does. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God is faithful. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Folks, though the world around us is ever-changing, ever-shifting, though the cultural landscape seems to be evolving on a weekly basis, can I encourage you that there is a being that does not change? That we serve a God who is steady, who is consistent, who is firm as the author of Hebrews says, who is a very anchor to our souls. So what will you do? What will you do when opposition comes your way? What will you do when persecution comes to your door? Will you keep the faith? You know, can I tell you, the Bible is full of examples of heroes who stood faithfully against opposition for the sake of Jesus' name and for the sake of the gospel. Can I tell you, there, if you look at any hero of the faith, any Christian you look up to, they have suffered greatly for the sake of the gospel. And not only have heroes in the Bible stood for that, but also heroes in history. Forty soldiers all Christians were part of the famed 12th Legion of Rome's Imperial Army. One day their captain told them that Emperor Licinius had sent on an edict that all soldiers were to offer a sacrifice to the pagan gods. And these Christian soldiers refused. It was the midwinter of AD 320, and the captain had marched them out onto a nearby frozen lake. He stripped them of their clothes and told them that they would either die or renounce Christ. Throughout the night, these men huddled together, singing their songs to Christ. But one by one, the temperature took its toll, and they fell to the ice and to the snow. At last, there was only one man left. He lost courage and stumbled to the shore where he renounced Christ. But little to everyone's knowledge, the officer of the guards had been watching this all along. Unknown to the others, he had secretly come to believe in Christ. When he saw that the last man broke rank, he walked out onto the ice, threw off his clothes, and confessed that he was also a Christian. When the sun rose the next morning, there were 40 bodies of soldiers who had fought to the death for Christ. To the very last breath, they claimed the name of Jesus. They stood fast. They kept the faith. Can I tell you, Jesus did not sacrifice himself on the cross for us to throw up the white flag, for us just to give up, for us just to give in. I won't deny that it is, it is scary. There is no doubt. But man, what a mockery of the gospel it would be. Oh, to spit in the face of Jesus, to make fun of the sacrifice made, and to give in to sin, to throw up the white flag, to give up the gospel. My friends, the cost was high. The price was paid. And because of that, we are co-heirs with Jesus. We are to be called the children of God. Can I tell you, with the privileges and opportunities that come with being a child of God, with, with the wonderful privileges that come with being a Christian, 
it comes a great responsibility. A responsibility to keep the faith. So can I ask you a tough question this morning? Maybe you work at a secular workplace. Maybe you have unsaved family members. When they mock your God, when they ridicule your faith, what will you do? Will you raise up the white flag? Will you give in? Or will you keep the faith? When this church is inevitably assaulted by the culture around it, will it wave the white flag? Or will it keep the faith? So my friends, how do we live in the light of the gospel? Well, we live in the light of the gospel by drawing near to God. By number two, by keeping the faith. And finally, and very briefly, number three, we live in the light of the gospel by loving one another. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It reads, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. The author writes, let us consider. It applies that we should have thoughtful, meaningful considerations and genuine concern for one another. Well, to do what? Well, he says to provoke one another unto love and good works. I think provoke is often thought in a negative context, but this is in a very positive one. It means to incite or to stir up or to spur on love within the community of God's church. And love to do what? To take practical action to do good works. Man, I am so thankful for the God-ordained community of the church. Have you ever truly considered that there are many people in this world who are alone? They don't have friends. They don't have a community They don't have a support network. Some of them don't even have a family. Yet when they enter the church, they're surrounded by a heavenly family. You know, I can only imagine that within this building and within this community, there have been some amazing stories of how community, God's family, surrounded one another. I'm sure many of you have have testimonies, how someone brought you a meal when you were sick. I'm sure many of you have testimonies about when you were in the hospital, pastor came to visit you. I'm sure many of you have testimonies when you were discouraged and down and hopeless, someone came alongside and gave you a hug and pointed you to Jesus. Man, what an amazing blessing to be surrounded by a spiritual family that looks out for us, that cares for us, and that values us. But the author continues in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that first portion, he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. You know, I I think this verse is often the pastor's favorite verse. (laughs) He loves when people show up on Sunday. And while we can joke about it, there is some great and serious truth. My friends, the church The family of God, it is important. We need each other to defend truth, to fight temptation, to battle discouragement, to wage war against sin, to grow in grace that's a true to the Father. My friends, we need the church. We need the church. And not only do we need the church, folks, the church needs us. It is a unique body of believers with talents and abilities and gifts all working together to make it function. The truth is, the church needs deacons. It it needs janitors and cooks and lawn care. It needs choir members and a music director. The church needs children's workers. Let me pause here. God bless you if you are a children's worker. You have a gift from God. 
I really do appreciate it. Always putting up with those wonderful questions. So my friends, how many, how many smooth stones did David pick out of the, the river there? Jesus. Thank you so much for putting up with that. Truly. My friends, the church needs you. It does. But I have a question. Has the church just become some holy huddle? Where we, we walk in, give each other a handshake, if you're from the south, a hug, maybe a high five or two, and we leave. Can I tell you, the church is not just a place to come in, hear some guy talk about God's word, and leave. The church is a very important word. It is a community. You know, you can show up every Sunday morning and still forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You ever thought about that? You can be a faithful member, sit on that pew, crack open your Bible, and still be forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. Why? Because the assembling of ourselves together isn't just listening to some guy preach in some book. It's about loving one another. It's about caring for one another. It's about developing meaningful relationships. It's about discipleship and mentoring and development. Do you have someone that you're meeting with regularly? Do you invest in their life? Do you have someone that you can crack open the word of God with every, every Thursday afternoon over coffee? Do you have someone that will look you in the eyes and say, this isn't good enough and help you get there? Or is your community of the church just showing up on Sunday and leaving? So I have a tough question for you this morning. Are you forsaking the assembling of yourselves together? Can I point you to something? When we neglect the community that God has established for us, you know what we're doing? We are mocking the price that it took to pay for it. Folks, the community of the church, the brotherhood and sisterhood of believers that we have access to, it was paid for, paid with a price. And when you show up Sunday morning and you leave out the door, when you forsake the assembling of yourselves together, you mock the sacrifice, the price that was paid for this. My friends, caring for the body of believers, it is not an option or an opportunity. It is a responsibility. Galatians 6 you says, bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the what? The law of Christ. In the book of James, he writes, he writes confess your faults and Pray for one another. You know a sign of a healthy church? It's when, when the Bible is closed from the pulpit. 30 minutes after the church service, the auditorium is still full. You know what I'm talking about? When I see that, it moves my heart. It really does. Because it communicates to me that people care. I'm telling you. I've been in many churches where when the preaching is done, about mm, five seconds later, <laughs> the auditorium is empty. <laughs> it's like, I, it's no joke. It's like people have their watch timer set and they're thinking, all right, he's done. Kids, get out the door. Get in the van. The pot roast is calling. And with that kind of mentality, the assembly of God has been forsaken. So how do you live in the light of the gospel? Man, you love one another. You draw near to one another. You mentor and disciple one another. Because what a shame it would be to have such an opportunity and to forsake it to look at the price that was paid for it and to spit in the face of Jesus and say, I don't need this. I'm fine alone. 
So I offer you a tough question this morning. Are you loving one another? No, really. When was the last time you called up a brother and sister and said, hey, let's talk? When was the last time you lovingly looked at someone, you looked them in their eyes, and you said, hey, I've noticed this. This isn't good. Can I help you get to where you need to go? So my friends, how do we live in the light of the gospel? Well, the text has been very clear this morning. We live in the light of the gospel by keeping the faith, by drawing near to God, by loving one another. Here's the deal. Everything we do in our Christian lives, it must be in the light of what Jesus did on the cross. The gospel, it is, it is not something to be put off aside, to be put in some attic box and to never be opened again. The gospel wasn't just for when you were saved. It's for every aspect of your Christian living. On one cold September morning, everyone went about their daily activities, their regular work schedule. People went into their cubicles, managers had their, their meetings, janitors began to, to sweep and mop the floor. As everyone was through their normal activities, their, their, their daily pursuits of work, they all heard the loudest boom they had ever heard in their entire life as the building shook violently, as a plane struck the tower. Panic and chaos ensued as people ran for their very lives. Some people made it down the stairs and escaped to freedom, but some were not so fortunate as debris blocked their way. Those people were left with a choice. Stranded dozens of floors above. It was either be consumed by the flame and crushed by the debris or jump. The cameras and onlookers could only watch in horror as people, some alone, and some held hands and embraced their loved ones as they jumped from the trade tower and plummeted to their death. You know, that day, that day has been forever etched in the history of America. That day, that day changed America for forever. It changed everything. It left such a great impact on our country. It changed how everyone lived their daily lives. Can I tell you? There was an event that didn't just change American culture, but it changed the very world. My friends, it was. It was the gospel. There was a phrase that was often said in the light of 9-11. Never forget. Can I ask you another tough question this morning? Have you forgotten the gospel? Have you forgotten? Does the gospel move you anymore? When was the last time you were brought to tears because you realized how much of a wretched sinner you were and how God pulled you out of the depths of hell? When was the last time that the gospel spurred you on to have a tough, a tough conversation with your secular coworker? When was the last time that the gospel spurred you to invite a brother and sister for coffee and to talk about how the relationship with Jesus was going? Or could you care less? So I'll ask you one more time. Have you forgotten? Can I encourage you? It's not too late. Can I encourage you? 
as James writes, draw nigh to God and he will what? Draw nigh to you. My friends, let us never forget because I am convinced that if a local church and a believer lives in the light of the gospel, it will change everything. We must live in the light of the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the price that was paid. God, I humbly and deeply ask that you would move our hearts that you would help us remember. God, that we would live every bit of our Christian life in the light of that amazing work on the cross. In your name, amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in your house today. Thank you for your word that came to us today. Help us truly to never forget what you have done uh, for us and every day and be the center of our lives and everything we do. And help us to live for you as we go our way. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen.